one. Yeah, you can light the second. Ed's saying improvise. Here, why don't you do Micah's thing? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Don't burn each other. There, the first candle is faith. The second one is hope. The next one is hope. Micah's lighting that. Okay, hold on. We're, uh, 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 we're over there. The third candle is, is love. The third candle is love, which was last week, I remember. Great. And then today, no, no, we don't light that one. We don't light the Christ candle until Christmas Eve, right? That's correct. <laughs> so today the we light, light the candle of joy. The candle of joy. There it is. Okay. Um, and then on Christmas Eve, we light the white Christ candle. That's correct. Beautiful. Okay, children, do you want to say anything? So. <laughs> so the candles represent, you know, as we prepare ourselves to reflect. I know Ed provided us with an Advent study that you've been going through. I think you guys got the same thing, but you're, you know, we're this is a special time of year, and it's this a real time of significance to what happened in our world that um, changed things, changed everything, and in the same way that it changed our world, and we still see that working out, you know, in fits and starts. Um, but still, it changes us and should change us. And we try to prepare our hearts for that and to consider how it changed us. And so the Advent is sort of leading up to that. And it's each, each Sunday kind of another aspect of it. And, and joy certainly should be one of them. The joy is, uh, um, you know, something that we should experience, which is different than just being kind of giddy or happy uh -oh. But it's rather a kind of unquenched, just unknowing that, that everything's good. God's got control and that he is going to win and that we're going to be a part of that, even though we don't see it. So that's joy. It's sort of just bubbling up underneath the stress of the blood. So we love you guys. Thank you, guys. Okay. And now we're, we're going to fire right the house. Put It's uh, Amen. Kind, of, kind of fun to uh, fill up our, our hour with uh, all kinds of stories and requests and prayers and, uh, and that sort of thing. It, uh, um, it, it's a blessing to be uh, amongst uh, you people and, uh, and the, uh, the, the faith that we have and the joy that we uh, we share and want to pass on to other people and the trust we have that God can bring his hope and healing into their lives. So it's just, uh, it blesses me to, uh, to be here with you. We're going to look at uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 8, a little bit this morning. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terribly frightened, I can imagine. The angel said to them, don't be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. Can you imagine how Mary felt when the shepherds showed up and told their story? If she had any doubts about the visits of the angels nine months earlier, I would guess that all her doubts were dispersed with the news of what the angel, the shepherds, experienced. The shepherds would have come to the stable looking for a baby born in the manger, and there probably were not very many stables uh, in that town that had commotion around them, and with a certain sensitivity, they could find the noise of an infant in the middle of the night. When they stood marveling at the scene that was before them, Mary, I'm sure, asked them, 
what brought you here? Uh, well, why, why are you here? And they would have told her, Joseph, and anybody else that was present about the angel they saw shining with all the glory of the Lord. And uh, different than the wise men who might have shown up two years later, we know that the angel came to them and said, the Savior is born this night in the town of Bethlehem. So they were there at that first manger scene. And, and they would have told how the angel said, today in the city of David, a Savior has been born, and it's the Messiah of God. And Mary knew that was going to happen. She had been sort of encouraged by Elizabeth that that was going to happen. And now nine months later, she hears it again from these shepherds who come walking in. And just to make sure you know this, the angel said to the shepherds, go into the town where you will find a baby in a manger. Wow. Uh, they would have talked about how the sky got bright with uh, myriads of angels singing praise to God, glory to God in the highest, and peace to everyone who loves the Lord. The message of these stories would have spread around the small town of Bethlehem. Anyone hearing would be wondering, what's God doing in our midst? They might not have the backstory that Mary cherished, but the tale of the shepherds alone would tell of a miracle that is enough of a miracle that people's lives would be changed for years to come. Mary took this experience and added it to what she knew, the visit of Gabriel to her, Joseph's encounter with an angel, the trip she took to her cousin Elizabeth's, the various revelations that God probably gave to her along the way. She could do nothing other than give praise to God, that he was fulfilling the prophecy that she had received just nine months earlier. The shepherds were filled with that praise. All that the angels had told them, they came and saw the proof that they needed to believe. I wonder, they didn't know the rest of the story. They did know the vision they had seen. They, they did know what they had found in the stable. <clears throat> that would have been enough to give them help to help them give thanks to God for years to come. It sometimes makes me wonder if people like them, those shepherds, were around in Jerusalem 30 years later and drew the connection between Jesus and his ministry and that baby in the manger. I know we we had um, talk here in Santa Cruz, oh gosh, what was it, maybe 20 years ago now, of this young phenom who was up at UCSC and was able to, uh, at the age of, I don't know, 13 or something like that, graduate with his degree. I, I don't remember all the details, but you know, it, it would be interesting if he were walking down the street today and if he were starting to claim these wonderful things, if people were to say, oh yeah, he was the kid that was the smart kid in school. You know, did people see Jesus on the streets of Jerusalem and around the, the area and say, yeah, I remember when he was born. I was there that night when that happened. I don't know. You know, life expectancy in those days isn't anything near what it is today. And so uh, if shepherds were already 15 to 25 years old and 30 years later, they'd have been 55, most of them might have been gone by then. But they might have died during that period, enjoying a life knowing that God had visited his people with the coming of the Messiah. If the shepherds had come to you with this story, would you have believed? It's easy to look back into history. Um, seems like a crazy story. These people see this vision. 
I've got a, a friend of mine who told me that he was sitting in Felton in a hot tub and he saw a UFO up in the sky and it bounced around and did all kinds of crazy things. And he, he was a pretty sharp guy and, and I trust him and he was convinced it was a UFO. I'm not sure that I believe in UFOs, but he was convinced that that's what he saw. Would some of the people in Bethlehem and around that area say to the shepherds, oh, you just saw some crazy phenomena up in the sky, but uh, you don't really know what you're talking about. But they saw the sky light up. They saw the angel to tell the, here they heard the angel tell them to go into Bethlehem. They found it just as the angel told them how hard it would be for them to go back to the sheep and not want to know the rest of the story and wonder for years to come what was uh, going on. You know, is it possible that they were caught up in this story because maybe one of them was married to uh, a lady and had a, a young child and that young child died because Herod sent his, his army out? Would they have drawn a connection between the two of those things? Uh, I, I don't know. But it makes me wonder. We have the blessing of the whole story. They could not see how it was going to end. Mary could not see the death that Jesus would die at the hands of the jealous religious leadership. She could not know the blessing this son would be to the whole world for thousands of years to come. Mary did know, though, that she was the mother of a child. And this child was not by man, but it was by God's doing. She did know, like the shepherds, what she had seen and heard. And she believed that God was behind it all. And just keep in mind, when God asks us to be a witness to other people, he never asks us to share more than what we have seen and heard. We don't need to tell them the whole story. We don't need to have perfect theology. We don't need to have anything other than what we know of how God has touched us, how Jesus has become a part of our lives. That's what we have to share. Her faith in God carried her through the embarrassment of pregnancy without marriage, the traveling to see Elizabeth, the trip to Bethlehem when she was nine months along, the birth in a stable, the wonder of the message the shepherd shared. I am amazed at how God uses the events of history to unfold his will for his people. Was it just this once? Or is God all, all the time orchestrating history each and every day for our good? Are the obstacles of life really the unfolding of the perfect plan of God? How the Psalms say that God prepared beforehand every day before there was any one of them. How Joseph, a different Joseph, saw his slavery in Egypt and his years of separation from his family as God meaning it for good in his life. How, as Solomon said, everything has its season and there's a time for every purpose under heaven. I, I wonder how Horatio Spafford, the, the hymn writer, could have penned the words when he knew that his family had died on the spot where he was in the ocean traveling from the U.S. to, um, to, to Europe. To, to see the family that remained. Whatever my lot, God has taught me to say, it is well with my soul. Yeah, I'm amazed at how God uses the events of history to unfold his will in our lives. And somebody said this week, I can't even remember the, 
the context of it, but it, it was fascinating to me because it was a phrase that just really spoke to me. Welcome the interruptions in your life. Rather than becoming frustrated or feeling as though the worst has come or uh, not knowing what's going to happen next, just welcome the interruptions in your life. It could well be God using history to lead you in the right direction. Now, I'm also amazed at how God uses ordinary people to bring about his will and his plan in history. Joseph, a carpenter, Mary, a peasant girl, Zacharias, an elderly priest, shepherds, wise men from the east. The list goes on and on forever. And it includes you and me, God using ordinary people to bring about his good in this world. And I'm also amazed at how God uses simple faith to open his arms and welcome people in from all walks of life, all experiences, all hurts, all pains. He wants you to be a part of his forever family. Now, I watch a lot of Hallmark with my wife, Hallmark movies. And one of the advertisements in the Hallmark movies is always about adopting dogs. And, and I don't know, you, you might know this, that I'm not a real fan of dogs. I got bit by a dog when I was five years old, big old chunk of my rear end by a chow. And uh, I, I, I've been terrified of dogs ever since, especially when I'm walking past a uh, a car and there's a big dog in it and uh, the dog just rushes over to that window and starts barking really loud. I'm terrified. I, I'm, I'm just, I get stuck in my tracks. But, but Hallmark always talks about having these rescue dogs being brought into their, what do they call it, the forever home or forever, forever family or something like that. Well, you know, that's exactly what God is offering to each and every one of us when he sends his son at Christmas. He's offering to us the opportunity to walk into his arms, climb up in his lap, be part of his home, and be part of his forever family. It's amazing how God wants to be close to us, how God makes a way for us, how God uses the events of history to make our life better, gives us the opportunity to welcome these interruptions in our life, how he wants to use us and our faith to make a difference in people's lives. The kids in New Jersey, did that to us this morning by sending their information and their uh, messages of hope and, and concern. We're doing it, Sue was doing it, Sue and Larry, as they were passing on these uh, gifts to other people. There are just so many opportunities that we have to take the faith that we know in Jesus Christ and pass it on to others. I just encourage you to do that this coming week uh, in all that you do. Let's, um, let's sing together.